the oldest desert in the world. Cave paintings that date back 27,000 years. Diverse wildlife, awe-inspiring nature, stunning ecotourism infrastructure, a bustling capital, and cute picturesque towns by the Atlantic Ocean. The country I am talking about is Namibia, possibly my favorite country. And now, unnoticed by many in the digital nomad community, Namibia has launched a digital nomad visa that will allow you to explore the country for five months. So in this video, I will introduce Namibia to you as a country. I'll talk about where to work and live as a digital nomad. And my favorite part, all the beautiful, fun things in nature you can do in Namibia. And last but not least, of course, as always, I will get into the visa details, what you need and how to apply. As always, if you want to jump right to the visa description or watch some other parts of this video at a later time, the timestamps are down below. Just click on them and they will take you right where you want to go. Hi, my name is Sarah. On this channel, I aim to provide you with everything you need to start the digital nomad lifestyle in confidence. If that sounds like you, please Click subscribe, hit the little notification bell, and without further ado, let's get right into my favorite country. Okay, let's get into some travel infos. Namibia, or as it goes by its official name, the Republic of Namibia, is a country in southern Africa. Its western border is to the Atlantic Ocean and it shares land borders with Zambia, Angola to the north, Botswana to the east and South Africa to the south and east. Namibia actually used to be governed by South Africa but gained independence from South Africa on the 21st of March of 1990 in the Namibian War of Independence. Its capital is Windhoek. Its official language since its independence is English, although actually only 3% of inhabitants in Namibia speak English as a first language at home. As with most African countries, there are plenty of different languages spoken in the country itself. Um, this goes back to colonization, when the colonizing powers, without ever having been to Africa, actually just took a map and, you know, divided it up as to how they thought it would be best for, I suppose, their own interests, which in some cases actually divided a lot of the tribes in the area and, you know, the land borders didn't make sense on land itself, which is why in many countries there are so many different languages spoken. Anywho, after this little tidbit of colonial history, let's get back to pr the present, where, as I said, the official language in Namibia is English. The language that in actuality is spoken by most people is Ushibambo. And amongst the white minority, Afrikaans, which is pretty close to Dutch, German and English are the main languages. Nevertheless, you will be absolutely able to get around in Namibia speaking English. Its currency is the Namibian dollar. Right now, at this point in time, one US dollar translates to 18 Namibian dollars and 25 cents. And if you've never been to Africa and you're having safety concerns, let me assure you that Namibia is a very safe country. To be precise, it is actually the fifth safest country on the continent and it has a stable multi-party parliamentary democracy. Sorry, that was a bit of a tongue twister for me. However, that doesn't free you from common sense safety precautions. And then I suppose I have one extra bit of security advice that might be more relevant to, you know, the African continent than other places, which is if you are camping in the wild, don't get out of your car at night. As first, I mean, you know, don't camp in, t in a tent that isn't, you know, on a roof at night. If you want to camp on a t in a tent on the ground, use campgrounds. But also, if you are, for example, car camping, don't leave your car at night and go into the bush to, for example, pee. Instead, find other ways to take care of the situation. Okay, a quick word about the weather. Namibia is part of the subtropical high pressure belt. This means that, particularly inland, it is frequently blue skies, very warm. However, in the desert, like in most deserts, it can get quite cold during the night. 
but on the Atlantic coast, for example, of Namibia, the temperatures are more moderate, let's say in the 20 degrees Celsius area, all year long. Its winter is from June to August and relatively dry. And it has two rainy seasons, both of them occurring in the summer. The small one between September and November and the big one between February and April. Some quick words on code of conduct and a few more safety things that we should probably talk about. First is the code of conduct, which is Namibia is one of the driest countries in the world. Meaning that if you're taking a shower, try to keep it short, because this country really, really has a water shortage. Now let's, you know, talk about a little bit of safety issues. One I've already talked about, which is basically don't leave your car at night and wander off into the bush. The second one also has to do with wildlife and the bush, which is don't drive at night. Namibia is actually a country where you have plenty of wildlife running around freely. When I traveled to Namibia, about 10 years ago now, I would say, I was so surprised that on the way from the airport across the highway to Windhoek, where we went, uh, you could, you know, out of the window of the car, see zebras and giraffes just walking by the street. So don't drive in the dark when you can't see what's in front of you and around of you. You know, the roads aren't, there aren't any, any road lights if you're out and about. And you really wouldn't want to drive into a zebra or even an elephant. Next, you should probably have a 4x4 if you want to go exploring. Um, Namibia's roads are some of the best kept in Africa, but only 10% of them are paved. Others are either gravel or plain sand. And avoid to drive in the deep sand of, for example, the desert if you are not familiar with how to drive in deep sand, because you're gonna get stuck. And Namibia being one of the least populated countries in the world, actually the second least populated country after Mongolia, you will sit in that sand for a while before somebody comes and helps you. On that note, never ever forget to bring enough water and enough fuel with you because gas stations and places to refill are far apart. Okay, but after all this talk about safety and security, let's get into some digital nomad must-haves. After all, you're not only there to experience the beautiful nature, you also probably will have to get a little bit of work done. Number one, as always, internet. Number one, internet and cell phone coverage. Um, both are stable and cell phone coverage is actually quite extensive. However, internet speeds might not be what you are used to. So this of course means that it depends also a little bit on your kind of work of whether you really really need very fast internet or if it is enough for you to have, you know, reliable internet access. That Namibia can offer you and even many of the campgrounds, hotels in national parks offer Wi-Fi. And again, cell phone coverage is there too. So if you stay for a while and you buy yourself a SIM card with an internet provider or with an internet flat rate, you can always hotspot for yourself with your phone. Tourism infrastructure. I've already said that the roads are some of the best in Africa. Namibia also is one of the prime locations for ecotourism in Africa, meaning that all infrastructure relating to tourism is very well built out. You have a lot of guided tours. If you don't want to go self-drive, you have some absolutely beautiful ecotourism campgrounds in, you know, the bush, the desert. Um, most of them actually, I was so surprised when we were there, most of them actually even have small swimming pools, which, you know, I personally, I guess I'm somebody who doesn't need much uh, creature comforts or many creature comforts. I was quite surprised by. Um, warm water, some really smart solutions as of how to warm water with, you know, while the barbecue, for example, is going. So there's some really smart and really beautifully made tourism infrastructure for ecotourism for discovering the country. You will probably arrive through the main gateway to the country, which is Windhoek Airport, unless you are already in Africa and are, for example, coming from South Africa or one of the other neighboring countries. Accommodation. You can, of course, find hotels, super fancy safari lodges, 
um, like I said you can rent a car and camp although maybe that is not something that you will be doing for five months or maybe you will I mean that would be cool um, there are different options there um, staying in natural parks and whatnot but if you choose for example to stay in Vintuk and make that your base and then you know do travel trips in between Vintuk and the two smaller cities of Svakopmund and Lüderitz which both are by the Atlantic coast all have beautiful apartments that you could for example also rent on Airbnb if you do not want to stay in a hotel generally at least in Vintuk most residential areas that I saw had some form of fencing around so they were closed guarded communities cost of living as usual my numbers come from Numbio which I can warmly recommend if you are planning a trip somewhere or a move somewhere and want to get a feel for the prices because they are crowdsourced and therefore always up to date um, I have translated the prices to US dollars because I feel US dollar is a currency that is easier to translate to whatever home currency if you don't have the US dollar you have for most of us. A meal in an inexpensive restaurant will cost you about $8.30. A cappuccino will cost you $1.60. Usually I mention transport passes here but all three cities that we're gonna look at so Vintuk, Svakopmund and Lüderitz um, are first of all relatively small so they can be walked and um, definitely after dark it is very recommended to um, take a cab instead of walking. So that's why in this video we're sticking to cab fares. One hour of waiting in traffic in a cab will cost you $2.50. This is because African traffic can be adventurous during rush hour um, so there is the cities will get quite clogged and you might actually end up standing in traffic for a while which again if you don't have that far to go and feel safe I recommend just walking an apartment in the city center and here we're talking Vintuk will cost you 355 US dollars and an apartment outside of the city center will cost you 271 US dollars. Where to meet other digital nomads? Well, like I said, the cities we're looking at here are Vintuk, Svakopmund and Lüderitz. Generally, co-working spaces aren't as common in Namibia. Part of the reason being that, you know, laptop lifestyle or laptop work isn't as common in Namibia or generally on the African continent. However, both Vintuk and Svakopmund have co-working spaces such as GoWork and Desert and Ocean co-working. You can always sit in a cafe and hotspot with your phone and those there are plenty of. Fancy coffee shops, smaller cafes, malls with fast food restaurants. So all of that is available and if you don't want to sit at home and work, these are places where you absolutely can. Let's take a closer look at Vintuk then, shall we? And here I would like to kind of say some words from the heart first. Um, that probably also have a background in my own heritage. I feel that for many who've never been to Africa, there is this set of prejudices that maybe we can clean up a little with here. Um, number one being that Africa is like a one country continent. So, you know, it's just Africa and all of Africa is the same, namely malaria infested, poor, and war torn and while there are a lot of places and a lot of countries that unfortunately have these conditions and where people unfortunately live under these conditions Africa is a continent like any other continent with a lot of different countries a lot of different cultures a lot of different identities and not all of them are the same also many places in Africa particularly the bigger cities are very developed are safe, are not disease infested and have great working healthcare. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about Vintuk, which is one of those places. Vintuk is a cute town, but it is a very developed town. Cafes, coffee shops, malls, like I said, healthcare system in Namibia is great and offering most of the amenities or the comforts that you would expect anywhere else as well. Vintuk is also very clean and it has a very interesting infrastructure. Um, Namibia actually used to be colonized by Germany. So <laughs> many places in Namibia have at least 
parts of German infrastructure, some of them actually looking more German than, you know, Germany. But not only when it comes to architecture, actually a lot of German traditions have been upheld by the descendants of those first German colonists. So there's German cafes, German beers, German restaurants, they even celebrate German carnival. While I was there I did visit a couple of restaurants and the mall in town. All of them were fine but nothing was super special. However, there was one restaurant that I would like to recommend that we ate dinner at twice, um, which is Joe's Beer House. Joe's Beer House is famous for, well, the interior is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. You have to see it by yourself. There is so much to discover there, but also the food, because Joe's Beer House specializes in game. Um, and by that, I mean, obviously, African game. So in Joe's Beer House, if you've ever wanted to try crocodile, zebra, ostrich, springbok, that's the place to go. Next on the list is Swakopmund, which is on the west coast of Namibia by the Atlantic and has about 44,725 inhabitants. So it is quite a lot smaller than Windhoek and it is a really, really cute town. One of those places that I mentioned that look very German in some parts of the city. Um, it is also, like I mentioned before, um, one of the places where the weather is a lot more moderate, meaning that you will have about 20-25 degrees all year round. So if you can't really deal well with excessive heat, that would be a good place for you to be. And it is both the gateway into exploring the Skeleton Coast, as well as into adventure travel into the Namib Desert, which is the world's oldest living desert. The town itself is actually very walkable. You don't need any kind of bus traffic, I would say. Um, and when it comes to adventure travel, for example, quad biking in the desert, or you can go, you know, on balloon rides, stuff like that, desert exploration things. Or you could drive to Valvis Bay, which is about 40 kilometers from Svakopmund and is a lagoon very famous for its marine life. It has hundreds of flamingos. You can, from Svakopmund itself, take boat trips. We took a, took a boat trip to go and see dolphins, which was absolutely a fantastic experience. Um, seals, you can see pelicans, and um, the whole area is, of course, because of its proximity to the Atlantic Ocean, also famous for its seafood. We, for example, had freshly caught oysters while we were looking at the uh, dolphins and you know I'm not really an oyster person at all but even I have to admit that those oysters were very tasty and if you want to explore the skeleton coast more you can from Svakopmund easily get to Hentis Bay and Cape Cross. Cape Cross is one of the biggest if not the biggest seal colony in the world. Last but not least the town of Lüderitz. Lüderitz is a coastal town in southern Namibia, so it faces the Atlantic Ocean and otherwise is surrounded by the Namib Desert. And it is so isolated that actually only one road goes into town. And because the Namib Desert is a moving living desert, they actually have to fight to keep that one road working and clean with bulldozers because there's so much sand constantly blowing over it. Like Svakopmund, it offers a very interesting mix between German colonial architecture and the deep African history of the country. From Lüderitz, you can of course also take some really interesting excursions. You can go see a penguin colony, you can go see seals and dolphins, and you can go and visit an abandoned ghost town. This ghost town is called Kulmanskop. It used to be a diamond mining town, but was abandoned in the 1950s when less and less diamonds were found in the area and new, bigger diamond mines, diamond mining places um, were established in other places of the country. So when the town was abandoned, the desert kind of reclaimed it, meaning that nowadays you can go visit the town, but you know, some of the buildings are actually at least half covered by sand. Other than that, Lüderitz itself offers bars, restaurants, coffee shops and is in general a nice sleepy small town. Things to do in Namibia. Well, the best way to see the country is actually to drive and camp. Um, you can, like I said, also 
choose to stay in lodges if that is something that is more comfortable to you but I felt that camping in the wild was the way to go um, personally I visited Namibia after having suffered a burnout in my previous job and I was really not doing very well mentally and being out in nature and the vastness of the country and I, I can almost not explain it you have to you have to have been there to, to feel it it really gave me so much calm so much peace and so much healing that this is my I am very biased towards going and camping in Namibia. There are two ways you can do that. Number one is to self-drive. In that case, you would probably rent a 4x4 with a roof tent or to do it with a guided tour. Okay, so if you go to Africa, I assume you want to see some wildlife, right? Well, other than the stuff that you're going to see, you know, just walking by the road, the best place to do so in Namibia is Etosha National Park. This is Namibia's biggest national park and wildlife reserve and it is so big that animals have the possibility to actually migrate in the park according to season. The name Etosha actually means great white place which refers to a really big salt pan um, that is in the in the middle of the park I suppose and this this salt pan it fills a little bit with water when it rains and it is so full of minerals that the elephants in Etosha National Park are the biggest elephants in the world because of all the minerals and vitamins that they get from that salt pan. It is also the best place in Namibia to see four of the big five. The big five when you go to Africa are lion, leopard, rhino, water buffalo, lion, leopard, lion, water buffalo, and hang on, elephant of course, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Elephant, of course. Yeah, so the only one you can't see is water buffalo. Itosha has both man-made and natural watering holes. And if I could make a recommendation, I would say to go at the end of the dry season. We went in October, for example, because then you have a real good chance at seeing the animals at the watering holes because there is no water anywhere else. And um, you have less vegetation. Um, on the downside, that means that it's really, really hot. Etosha offers beautiful campsites and is so big that you actually can spend several days there traveling from campsite to campsite. So we spent in total three days there and um, all campsites or most of the campsites have, well, they're fenced in, so you can be sure that no hungry lion will come for a dinner snack. Um, they have functioning amenities. Um, the ones we went to also had um, lodges attached if you don't want to camp. They had small restaurants where you could eat, but they also had barbecue facilities and stuff. And some of them have um, watering holes. They are built by watering holes so that these watering holes are floodlighted during the night so that you can even sit in the comfort of your campground and watch animals come to the watering hole at night and observe them. Your best chance at seeing wild animals is actually to get up as early as possible and leave the park when the gates open. So that is something to be aware of, particularly if you self-drive. The gates to the park close in the evening and they open in the morning for safety reasons, you know, so to as to avoid hungry lions coming for a snack. Actually, when we were there, we could hear lions roaring from our tent. So it was kind of comforting to know that they couldn't come in. Anyways, your best chance to see animals is to leave the park as soon as the gates open and head to the water holes, because that's when the animals will come out to drink. During the day, they will mostly hide somewhere in the shade because it is way too warm to do anything. One tip that um, we learned from our camping guide is that if you have food that won't spoil, that you maybe not be eating and that, you know, are leftovers, to wrap it tight and leave it somewhere high up where the animals can't reach it for the people that tend to the campgrounds. I mean, um, poverty is a real thing in Africa, also in Namibia, and these people will be happy over some leftover food and a warm meal. It's the same when you go into restaurants and you won't finish your plate, don't have it thrown away. Take it with you and give it to there. Are some people waiting outside the restaurant sometimes just waiting for particularly tourists to leave and leave them their leftovers so they can feed their family at home. If you would like to know more about tribal culture I can warmly recommend Oase village. Oase village is a Himba village um, on farmland 
where the Himba tribe, one of the tribes in Namibia, still to this day lives in their traditional way. Oh, this is a beautiful place to, to visit. I was deeply impressed with these light solutions to their school. As you can see, it's just a tin roof and they cut some holes into the roof and put some plastic bottles in that would let in the lights that function as light bulbs. But not only present culture is interesting in Namibia. Like I said in the introduction, it also sports some really old cave paintings. For example, at Twiffelfontein. Twiffelfontein actually translates to doubtful water spring, I guess you would translate it. Um, it's, a, it's an Afrikaans or Dutch word. Um, so there used to be somebody settled on the land and thought there might be water, but wasn't really sure. So that's the translation to the name and um, it's a beautiful site where you can see a lot of fantastic cave paintings. It is in the Kunene region in northwestern Namibia and has at least 2500 items of rock carvings that you can look at as well as a few rock paintings. We did a tour there and the tour guide showed us some of the most important spots. It is also a great way to support, of course, the locals that work in tourism there. If you are into rock paintings, the most famous rock painting in Namibia is on its highest mountain, the Brandberg, and it's called the White Lady. This area, the area of the Brandberg, is a site of great spiritual importance to the Sun people of Namibia, so one of Namibia's tribes. And to reach the White Lady, you will have to hike about 40 minutes over rough terrain. However, there are hundreds of more paintings higher up the mountain that you could also discover. Okay, now that we've covered wildlife and culture, let's dive deeper into the absolute natural beauty of Namibia. Um, number one would be Fish River Canyon. Fish River Canyon is the second largest canyon in the world after the Grand Canyon. It is possible to hike Fish River Canyon, which will take you about four to five days. However, you will need a permit for security reasons so that if you don't show up they will go and send a search party and this is only possible from April to September. This is because of a the heat in the canyon that otherwise gets too hot and of the risk for flash floods when it rains. Next place that Namibia might be the most famous for Dead Vlei and Susu Vlei in the Namib Naukluft Park. So this is probably the most photographed area in Namibia and let me tell you, for good reason. So if there's only one thing you do when you visit Namibia, do this. This place leaves you in awe of our planet. It is hauntingly beautiful and peaceful and it leaves you very aware of how small you are in the big scheme of things. The Namib Naukluft part is a ecological protected area in the Namib desert and the Namib desert is the oldest living desert in the world with the highest sand dunes in the world. Some of them actually 300 meters and higher. So Susufle is a salt and clay pan that is surrounded by high red dunes located in the southern part of the Namib desert. For a once in a lifetime experience and to escape the worst of the heat it would be best to enter Susufle through the Caesarium gate at the park as soon as it opens. That way you can make it to your first dune by sunrise. We stopped at dune 45. It's called so because it is 45 kilometers past Cesrium on the road to Susufle. It is 80 meters high and it's composed of over 5 million year old sands. We climbed it just in time for sunrise, rolled it down and then had breakfast in front of it. Next stop, Susuvle. When you reach Susuvle, there are three parking areas on the last six kilometers to Susuvle. The last two of them, if you choose to drive there, you can only drive there if you have a 4x4 and if you are experienced in driving in sand. You will get stuck in the sand otherwise. Another option is to take the shuttle that is offered or to do like us, we hike the six kilometers. The terrain was okay, it was quite flat, but it was getting warmer and warmer, which was, you know, you have to be able to handle the heat, but it was beautiful hiking through the desert like that. From here, some of us decided to climb the dunes to enter Dedvle, which is about two kilometers from Susuvle. This was a really great experience, but a tough hike, climbing up multiple dunes as it got hotter and hotter. I really only recommend this if you are in good physical shape and have plenty of water. Two kilometers doesn't sound like much, but when you are spending it climbing up dunes in the merciless sun, nothing on the horizon but more red sand, then they can feel very far. That being said, finally summiting the last dune in the burning sand and the over 40 degrees heat 
and looking down into Dedvle at the bottom of our feet was like a Fata Morgana. Dedvle used to be an oasis with camel thorn trees and as I stood there on top of the dune looking down into the dry valley I tried to imagine how it looked thousands of years ago. Now the only reminders are the dried skeleton of these trees as the ever-moving sand dunes cut off the river that fed the valley. On the way to your next stop you should consider stopping at a very special place which probably has the best apple pie in all the country. Solitaire sits just below the Tropic of Capricorn at the center of of the 45,000 acre solitaire land trust which is dedicated to preserving the grassland ecosystem and the wild animals that reside here. And you know what? I guess this says a lot about me and my personality but that's my happy place. I dream about living in solitaire a couple of months so if I were to take the Namibia digital nomad visa that would probably where you would find me. It's this really cute town of not even a hundred inhabitants. It is a popular stopover for tourists. It has a bakery, a cafe, you can get some cold drinks, you can get the apple pie, but honestly solitaire is the right name for it. Number one because it refers to the solitaire diamond, it's a really special place, but also because of solitude. It's so calm, so peaceful in the middle of the desert. I just you know, again, one of these places you just get a good feeling. Now if apple pie in the middle of the Namibian desert is not enough to make you at least consider to stop in solitaire, it also has a cheetah sanctuary that you can visit, which is close by. Here they are taking care of cheetahs that for some reason cannot live or be released in the wild at the moment. So rescue animals and they are really doing great work and trying to prepare the majority of these animals to be released in the wild eventually. I hope I could really convey my love for this country, its people and its beauty to you. Because like I said, it's probably my favorite place in the world. If you got value out of this video I would really appreciate it if you would hit the like button which is a free way for you to support me in growing this channel. Thanks a lot and let's get right into the visa details. The visa targets remote workers, freelancers and self-employed people so digital nomads and allows them to stay in Namibia for a total of five months. You need to prove an income of at least 2,000 US dollars per month. An additional 1,000 US dollars per month if you would like to bring a spouse plus 500 US dollars per child that you would like to bring. You need to prove these through, for example, pay slips, bank statements, or the like. Furthermore, you need valid health insurance and valid travel documents for everybody. So, for example, a passport. If you bring children, you also need to bring birth certificates for the children to prove that you are the parent. And should you not bring the accompanying parent, the other parent to the child, you need to bring a permission slip so that you know everyone knows that you're not kidnapping your children. Upon arrival in Namibia you will need to pay the visa fee which is approximately 62 dollars or a hundred Namibian dollars and once you have sent in all paperwork to the authorities it'll take about two weeks until you get an email for the visa to be approved if everything is in order. The, bans the bank statements that you need to prove your income should be going back at least six months. So you need to prove that you've had that income for six months or longer. Last but not least, you're gonna need a motivational letter either from your employer stating that you are allowed to work remotely and um, what you're doing, what your job is, or a letter uh, that proves that you are self-employed plus a clean criminal record. Once you have compiled all this paperwork, you will apply online. I will link it down below as usual. One important last step would be that all paperwork needs to be translated to English. And if Namibia doesn't sound like your place because maybe you don't like warmth or the desert, why not check out this last week's video about the digital nomad visa to Iceland. With that said, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you here in the next one.